I think we can start and then we I uh, I manage with Ethel. Okay. I start now. Good evening to everybody and thanks for participating to this interesting IOP webinar on COVID-19 and the management of ILD patient challenges and recommendations. This webinar is uh, by ERS and uh, by our Assembly 12. I am Venerino Poletti, the chair of Assembly. I am the pleasure to co-chair the session with Caterina Antonio and we have, we will, we have a very good um, group of speakers. And you see the agenda, we have the first talk, Diagnosis of ILDs, Pills and Pitfalls by radiologist Giorgia Dal Piaz, and then Interventional Procedures by Sara Tomasetti, ILDs patient in the year of pandemic COVID-19 at all wells. Traumatic diseases with ILD management, Elizabeth Renzoni, main clinical trials for COVID-19, main issue for ILDs patient by Bruno Cristani, and the day after inpatient recovery with pre-existing ILD by Sergio Arari. And uh, now is the turn of uh, Caterina. She will explain you how to uh, manage the question and answers, and then we start with the presentation. Caterina, it's over to you. Ed, I don't hear. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I have the pleasure uh, to uh, chair uh, with Venerino Poletti this uh, ILD Assembly 12 initiative uh, in the era pandemic uh, of COVID-19. Uh, it is an initiative of uh, the European Respiratory Society, and uh, I'm very glad uh, that uh, you are more than 200 people uh, this afternoon with us. Uh, we have uh, the pleasure uh, to have with, uh, uh, with us excellent and uh, speakers and colleagues and friends uh, for, uh, from countries that are very, very involved in the uh, COVID-19 disease uh, and also the ILD uh, uh, field, I think is a very interesting uh, field uh, and you will see why. Uh, I think that uh, we have to continue with the first speaker and uh, at the end uh, we will have a little bit of time for discussion and uh, uh, everyone who has a question please uh, write it down and uh, I think that at the end we will have the time to sum up uh, and all the speakers we will be very glad uh, to answer uh, your questions, please. I so, think Venerino, yes, you have to introduce George. Yes, so it's my pleasure to present my friends and very important radiologist, Giorgio Dalpias from Bologna, Italy. If you just take note, the majority of people here are speaking Italian, but I see only by chance. Okay, Giorgio, it's your turn. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much to everyone. And uh, I thank you very much in particular, Venerino and Caterina for inviting me in this very interesting webinar regarding uh, interstitial lung uh, disease. And uh, I try to proceed with the slide. Excuse me, Ali. Uh, oh. uh, sorry. Oh, ah, OK, sorry. <laughs> and uh, OK. And uh, the, in my short presentation, I would like, uh, I'm going to uh, highlight it, three uh, main aims in only 10 minutes. And so I, I like the HICT uh, partner of uh, uh, pills and pitfalls uh, regarding the COVID pneumonia, but also some example of uh, COVID in patients with persisting interstitial lung disease. And uh, finally, we have, do not uh, forget, the extrapulmonary um, uh, involving imaging in COVID disease. And um, HRCT is an uh, important tool for diagnosis, but also management of interstitial lung disease. Historically, we know there are some uh, pattern, nodular pattern, cystic, reticular, and, and also fibrous. But the uh, alveolar pattern is the main pattern in this COVID health. 
and because uh, uh, the main, there are two main signs, elementary lesion, in particular gum grass opacity, and uh, consolidation. And uh, these uh, uh, two signs uh, are, are uh, visible in patients also in early uh, disease, in particular ground grass opacity in early disease is the main sign in the uh, consolidation compare, may compare in the, in the evolution of, of the disease. It, why we can see this sign, ground grass opacity? We have some uh, biopsy, uh, in, but also in vivo, but also in particular in post-mortem uh, autopsies revealed that uh, this sign are due to COVID pneumonia, but also with the DAD, diffuse arterial uh, damage, uh, very often in different phase in the same patient. This is very particular. But also, uh, gum glass consolidation may due to infarcts and also hemorrhage. In the, in the late stage of disease, in particular in patients with uh, interstitial care unit to recover for some weeks, you can see also um, suffering post in due to infection very frequently in this patient. And so uh, there, uh, there is a, there's a called a typical pattern in early disease, also present in patients with uh, not symptomatic, in pouch symptomatic patients. And, uh, and, uh, and the typical aspect is multifocal, bilateral, gland glass opacity, but also uh, wedge shaped, uh, that's in this medium, wedge shaped uh, GGO. And in um, some patients also rounded, uh, rounded gland glass opacity, and, and also with this particular new sign, this for me is a pearl sign because it's very characteristic in the, the vascular dilatation inside the areas of ground glass opacity or in proximity of this area. Consolidation may also coexist in the early phase and very often on the basis, but our other pearl is no pleural effusion in this uh, phase of the disease. And um, I suggest with article uh, this paper because it's very interesting for me. And I suggest uh, this tool for uh, for imaging for H for CT. And this this is called a dual energy CT. It's a particular a new uh, new era CT because uh, they highlight the possibility to diagnose the thromboembolism, but also. Uh, to highlight the uh, maps in the parenchyma, in the, uh, in, the, in the map of perfusion, very interesting. Also in this case, because uh, uh, some uh, paper highlight the presence uh, in uh, autopsy in particular of microvascular thrombosis, uh, not only diffuse damage, but also microvascular involvement. And so uh, in this example, beautiful, we can see this ground grass area, and inside there is uh, ex, uh, the pearl sign, in vessel enlarging side, segmental vessel, and the perfusion highlight the presence of uh, uh, um, maybe of infarcts. And so uh, it, this is a very, very, uh, very interesting uh, tool. And um, unfortunately, the uh, for the typical part is not always present and, and, and very often we can see also in post pandemic era, um, you can see the, the so-called indeterminate city features with multi also in this example, multifocal or diffuse with a, a crazy pain, possible crazy paving. So lacking a specific distribution, also cortical area, but also in parahylar and with possible consolidation on, on the basis. And, and so in this case, it's very difficult in, uh, in, uh, during uh, in this era, the, the differential diagnosis of other uh, opportunistic uh, infection. For example, the uh, report in both cases was consistent with COVID pneumonia in both images, but uh, the final di diagnosis here was uh, COVID pneumonia, and in this case, this uh, was pneumocystis uh, pneumonia. And 
regarding the, the later phase, uh, unfortunately, some case, uh, the, uh, the process was dramatic. Also in this case of the patient, uh, 50 year old male with history of fever, cough, in seven days uh, of the symptom and hypertension. And the, the early phase uh, highlighted a diffuse uh, high ground grass opacity with the, in a specific indeterminate pattern. But after two weeks, uh, the patient was, and unfortunately compared the thromboembolic phenomena. And after uh, five weeks, uh, the patient died. And in, in this later phase, we can see the ground glass was diffuse, and, uh, but the consolidation prevalent in the dorsal region, gravitational with gravitational distribution, and uh, compare this per other per sign. There is a, a cavitation inside this consolidation. And in this case, uh, we are and we are very confident with the bacterial sore infection in the, in the post-mortem autopsy in this, of this patient uh, highlight the presence of that in different stage. In the, in the upper lobes prevailed the uh, early phase, a sudative phase of diffuser nerve damage in the, on the basis prevalent the prevalence of organizing and fibrotic, uh, and fibrotic lesions. Also are also present as tissue pneumonia, but also infarcts and uh, bacteria superinfection. Um, fortunately, some patients do not have a dramatic evolution, and though in this case, uh, the patients uh, uh, on was um, was good in the um, in, uh, in in this uh, corona retrospective imaging we can see uh, the prevalent factor on the later phase and very similar with other interstitial lung disease for example very similar with collagen and vascular disease because we can see there's a cold organizing pneumonia pattern um, there are some consolidation, both as um, bronchovascular, but also peripheral with just little distortion of the architecture. And the, the so-called also appear sign, the so-called perilobular pattern. And though in this case is very difficult, the, the difference in diagnosis, oh, but due to secondary uh, of uh, collagen vascular disease, but also drug, the also the drug lesion. But in this case, there is a fearless sign. Look at these images, and this is a maximum intensity project, projection. And so uh, this uh, reconstruction highlight the, this sign, the so-called uh, vascular dilatation sign. But also in some patient, I, I saw this particular and in tortoise images resembling uh, shunts and peripheral shunts in, uh, uh, of these uh, patients. In, um, in uh, the differential, the diagnosis may be very challenging also in patients with pre-existing interstitial lung disease. I, uh, I mean, uh, for example, like in these images, we can see in patients with dyspnea and fatigue and chronic cardiac disease, the diagnosis was not possible because the first PCR was negative. And so we can see the typical aspect of pulmonary edema, ground glass opacity prevalent in the, on the basis with superimposed smooth thickening of the secondary lobe uh, septa. But, uh, mm, Look at this five days after directed therapy. It's a very interesting case because we the septal thickening disappear, and but remain the ground glass opacity. In uh, the second PCR was positive for COVID pneumonia. Another example, the example of a changing case is a patient with COPD. And with the case before COVID pneumonia, we can see uh, in these images uh, the typical aspect of central lobular emphysema in the upper lobes. 
And these are with the cases with superimposed ground glass opacity due to uh, COVID pneumonia. And though the, the, the emphysema assumed the aspect similar with cystic pattern in the, with the thin walls, but after only after five weeks, uh, we can see that uh, the, uh, the change in the aspect because we can see uh, the, uh, the, the cystic was enlarged, but also the volume of the both lung was reduced. So I suppose because due to uh, fibrosis, maybe, but, but because of, there was also little distortion of the architecture by particular volume loss, if you compare with the uh, previous uh, images. Uh, in, the, in the, this enlargement of airspace of uh, emphysema may be due to a uh, barotrauma in these patients. In the, an, an another example uh, is IPF, uh, fibrous disease. And so also in case it's very challenging because it is very difficult. The differential diagnosis because uh, COVID pneumonia in IPF patients or with the acute exacerbation of IPA is very difficult. And um, interesting, we can see that follow up uh, after five weeks later, we can see with the volume was reduced for the, by the both lungs with uh, some condolations um, and traction bronchiectasis, maybe due to organism phase of diffuse alveolar damage and the progressive fibrosis. fibrosis. And uh, this concept uh, is highlighted by Paolo Spagnolo in this uh, beautiful paper in a letter to the editor and um, that highlight the possibility where the burden of uh, pulmonary fibrosis recovery uh, is uh, possible for like in this example, only often after three weeks, we can see fibrosis in uh, these patients. And, um, and uh, finally, uh, I, 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 say, I suggest, uh, please don't forget that, that coronavirus is a systemic disease. In, uh, in the, as uh, uh, demonstrated with uh, biopsy, post-mortem autopsy, and the, the disease may involve uh, some parenchymal abnormal uh, organ, in particular uh, the liver with uh, uh, liver dysfunction, uh, um, dysfunction, but also in particular, uh, this disease may involve the, uh, the knee. And so uh, not rarely, the patient die due to uh, the corona pneumonia, but also due to uh, other in the in arena failure. In the, um, in the I recommend we should be caution regarding the contrast enhancement, both with CT and, and MRI, because in patients, uh, patient with acute renal failure due to uh, coronavirus may worse after a constant enhancement. And so I suggest also to he use the ultrasound, it's very, speci very sensitive, specific for this diagnosis. And so the, my conclusions, uh, uh, please look at the H uh, HT per size and also and use uh, uh, also uh, MIP uh, for highlight uh, these signs. And uh, I suggest to use a CT, a dual and CT angiography for a map um, or for parenchyma or to um, find down sign of parenchyma or gamia. And um, also, uh, I'm, I suggest to uh, look at the uh, comorbidity of the patient in the chain, please. Uh, check uh, or their previous CT to compare with the CT uh, with COVID pneumonia. And uh, uh, I assume uh, the next speaker will be able to speak about progressive fibrosis in this disease. And uh, finally, do not forget extra pulmonary involvement of COVID uh, uh, disease. And um, in the last uh, Slide is uh, 
regarding uh, for the audience, uh, uh, there is uh, four answer. Cavitation inside uh, inside uh, strong is suggested of, and the, the, the audience can answer of this uh, question. Please answer. In the right, can. Okay, I'm finished my. Okay, uh, the right answer is bacterial super infection, right? But uh, be careful because also, in fact, uh, in the, with superimposed uh, infection may uh, produce uh, cavitations and also barotrauma may is responsible for cystic appearance inside ground glass opacity and also in consolidation. Thank you very much. I'm finished. Uh, thank you, Georgia. Uh, I think uh, they replied very well and you have the time. Uh, you are lucky because you have the time to reply uh, to two interesting questions already for you, uh, but you can take a brief. Uh, everything, <laughs> every brief counts. And uh, it is my pleasure and honor to have with us uh, Professor Tomasetti, Sara, uh, from uh, uh, Florence, Italy. She, she left Venerino uh, in Forli and she moved uh, in order to uh, be the head of the department, uh, the interventional clinic in Florence. And uh, she is very, very active uh, uh, in uh, both ILDs and interventional procedures. And uh, we are, have the honor to have Sarah with us everybody uh, I will uh, I, first of all I want to thank the organizers for inviting me in this uh, uh, ERS uh, webinar uh, I hope uh, everybody can hear me well can you hear me yes okay so uh, I will just present a few slides about interventional procedures in uh, ILDs uh, just uh, mentioning some of the issues that we had during this COVID pandemic. And uh, I have no conflict of interest to declare. Uh, first of all, I want to start with BAL, which uh, currently has been the interventional procedure that has been more uh, useful during the COVID pandemic. And then I will just touch the EBUS, EUS, and transbranchial, and I will talk more thoroughly about uh, uh, transbranchial lung biopsy. So basically on uh, BAL, uh, we know that in COVID, the, the sensitivity of BAL is, was 93%, so significantly higher compared to uh, nasal swaps, uh, nasal pharyngeal uh, uh, RT-PCR. Unfortunately, BAL exposes the uh, operator to a high risk of uh, contamination and for these reasons has been discouraged by uh, several uh, uh, bronchology um, uh, committees uh, and, uh, and guidelines. So we have uh, in our institution, and I'm aware of other centers that uh, basically do the same, we have limited the use of bronchial velar lavage in cases with two negative nasal uh, RT-PCR but still clinical and radiological suspicion for COVID-19. And uh, of course, all the bronchoscopists were equipped with uh, positive pressure respirators and uh, the BAL procedure in uh, suspected or confirmed COVID cases was performed only in dedicated COVID areas and endoscopic rooms. In interstitial lung disease, we know that BAL is still important, even though we do not have uh, large trials, we still know that is an important part of the algorithm in many experience centers, can give information in many interstitial lung diseases, and in some of these can be even diagnostic itself. During the COVID pandemic, uh, we have continued to, to do uh, EBUS and EOS mainly for oncologic patients because uh, interventional procedure for any other disease where 
stopped, at least in our country, uh, except with the exception of uh, oncologic patients. So we have continued to perform EBUS and EUS, uh, talking uh, about ILDs. We know that EBUS and EUS are useful mainly in sarcoidosis, of course, and then the use of this less invasive diagnostic procedure has completely, almost completely overcome the surgical procedure in the last decade with less than 5% diagnosis of um, sarcoid requiring now mediastinoscopy. And I think that in the near future, this is exactly what will happen with transbranchial lung cryobiopsy that, as many of you know, is a safe alternative to surgery for the diagnosis of interstitial lung disease. During the COVID pandemic, in, uh, in, at our center, we haven't performed cryobiopsy. We just restarted with cryobiopsy couple of weeks ago in patients who are not COVID and have a proven negative nasal swaps within 48 hours from the procedure. Uh, but I know that uh, I'm aware that Venerino in Forli has performed cryobiopsy in COVID, which is a research protocol of, I believe, great interest. So why should we biopsy? Why have we restarted uh, our cryobiopsy in interstitial lung disease? Well, this is clear because we need an accurate diagnosis to our patients. And even now that we, if we will have uh, in the future treatment for a progressive disease, we still have to understand what is the exact underlying diagnosis. And then after that, uh, assess the longitudinal trends before uh, making um, to make an uh, um, informed and more precise uh, treatment decision. We know that in ILDs, diagnosis is prognosis, and uh, a surgical lung biopsy has been proven in the past to give important uh, to give. Uh, uh, accurate prognostic data, and we have recently proven that it also transbranchial lung cryobiopsy can uh, stratify correctly IPF from non-IPF uh, from a prognostic point of view. Uh, again, we know that both cryobiopsy and surgical lung biopsy increase significantly observer confidence in the diagnosis when the initial uh, clinical radiological diagnosis is uncertain. And recent data that we have not published yet um, have explored the clinical relevance of the information. And we found out that the histologic information changed the clinician treatment approach in one third of cases and um, it changed the initial uh, diagnostic hypothesis in one fifth of cases. And interestingly, how, as you may note, the red line are IPF cases reclassified after biopsy revision. And you can see that their prognosis is uh, identical to that, to that of uh, um, IPF cases confirmed and strikingly divergent from non-IPF cases. So pathologic reclassification of cases carries prognostic significance and helps to optimize treatment decision. We know that we have prospective uh, trials uh, that have proven the accuracy of transbranchial lung cryobiopsy. Uh, this study from Troy has shown that surgical lung biopsy was useful in a minority of patients, and particularly when the diagnosis after cryobiopsy is of high confidence, the, um, the correlation with, the, with the surgical lung biopsy is above 90%. Uh, it is important to stress safety. So there are three things to remember. We need to use uh, bronchial blockers, a fluoroscopy guide, and to choose the optimal site, which is the area under the pleura to avoid the, the risk of bleeding and to control bleeding. And this recent research letter has shown us that patients with rapid respiratory deterioration should not undergo uh, cryobiopsy due to the risk of acute exacerbation. 
Uh, pneumothorax occurs in about 10% of cases. A little bit more difficult is to um, uh, exactly detect the incidence of bleeding rates, but um, we know that uh, uh, fatal or uh, life-threatening bleeding has been uh, reported mainly in centers that were not appropriately using uh, bronchial blockers. Uh, the uh, survival, the mortality of the procedure of transbronchial and cryobiopsy has been proven in studies and meta-analysis to be lower compared to surgery. And so we can conclude that uh, transbranchial lung cryobiopsy and surgical lung biopsy have a similar diagnostic accuracy, prognostic validity, and uh, uh, impact on uh, multi-diagnosis, uh, uh, multidisciplinary diagnosis and treatment decision. Uh, transbranchial lung cryobiopsy is safer compared to surgery and, of course, has all the advantages of an endoscopic procedure. Uh, of course, careful patient selection, adequate training of the bronchoscopist are advisable and are important. And the Venerino teaches us that even in the acute phase in COVID patient, it has been safe and possible to perform cryobiopsy to obtain um, uh, data that uh, will be of great relevance. So uh, even if I move to Florence, I want to thank uh, Venerino and all my colleagues in Forli because without them, we would not have all the data that we have on, on cryobiopsy. And now I just have a couple of minutes for, for the question. Uh, that is, uh, of course, about uh, uh, transbranchial lung cryobiopsy and the option as uh, RA has an overall mortality of 2%, B is complicated by pneumothorax in 50% of cases, C has shown a uh, uh, utility similar to surgery, D has never been uh, studied in, um, in, tri uh, in prospective trials. So I think that now you can vote. Um, <clears throat> I don't see the results yet. I think we can probably go ahead. Oh, okay. So yes, the, the, the answer is correct. Uh, the utility is similar to SLB. And of course, uh, the 8%, uh, uh, the 2% mortality refers to surgical lung biopsy and not to transbranchial lung cryobiopsy. So thank you very much for your attention and for giving me this opportunity to share with you some, some data. Thanks, Sarah. Now it's my great pleasure to invite our friends and I think our teacher, Professor oh, oh, oh. From, from London, Hattel. Thanks for, for staying with us. <laughs> I hope that I'm audible. Um, somebody, you need to wave at me, Venerino. I'm not going to get away with calling me your teacher. I'm sorry. I already am old and ugly enough without that particular introduction, but thank you very much. My teacher, my teacher. <laughs> oh, that's, that's more like it. That's more like it. Yeah. Um, so we've had two fine talks, of course, dealing with what we already know, 
but setting it out beautifully in a very short period of time. My task is more to take you to uncertainties. A week is a long time in COVID right now when it comes to what we learn in a very rapid time. And ILD is a moving target. So I see my talk as a general introduction to other talks that are coming, where I hope to isolate key uncertainties. And I'm trying my utmost here. That's good. This does seem to work. So I'm going to touch on these issues. Again, as I say, highlighting uncertainty. And I'm going to start with the issue of risk stratification for ILD patients. Now, you would have said at the start, I think we all did, that ILD patients, especially IPF patients, really should be at very high risk indeed. You go down the risk factors we recognize, age, think of the comorbidities, especially in IPF, average gas transfer under 50%, so they in IPF start with a major impairment of reserve, moderate infection should be highly challenging in these patients. In non-IPF, you have the issue of immunosuppressive therapy. Intuitively, it felt like a risk that COVID accompanied by an active interstitial disease would not be a great cocktail. And then the virus really ought to be triggering acute exacerbations. And so what has been very surprising, and this is not yet definitively proven, is the rapidly accumulating experience that patients with the various ILDs have surprisingly little severe COVID. Now, we can think about why that might be, and I'm obviously not saying that these patients have a lower risk than the general population, but it does not seem to be unduly increased at the very least. Anecdotal experience can be misleading. We need further studies, but if we accept this, is it that interstitial lung disease patients and sarcoid patients shielded? That does not work in Italy where infection was rampant before shielding. And you can say the same for New York. And the feedback I have is that experience in Italy is along the lines I've outlined. Now, it may be that the therapies used in ILD, be they lower dose immunosuppression or even antifibrotic therapy, are in some way protective early in the course of the disease, which we don't actually understand because we have studied advanced disease. But it may also be that the pathways that are COVID driven are already locked into ILD pathogenesis if you have an established ILD. Think of the fact that smokers don't tend to get HP and you have a precedence. So taking all of this aboard, we are all in a position now that patients are coming out of lockdown in countries with shielding. They are coming out of shielding. What advice do we offer? And I think all I can say is that the existing risks that simply apply across ILD, but I'm not sure that we should advise ILD patients to go on shielding once they've gone through the peak of the epidemic. And I think these ultra safe approaches put huge stress on patients with the psychological effects of isolation, and I'm not sure they're justified. And I think the other question very clearly, and this is a question on which I don't have an answer, but it's the review the need for continuing on current immunosuppressive dosages. And so this is my question and there's no answer, but I'd like a spread of opinion so that later speakers speak knowing what the spread of opinion is. And these are the four options. Uh, in your non-infected ILD patients, you A, increase steroid therapy because you're worried about steroid requirements. B, you actually stop steroids altogether. C, you simply reduce steroid in five milligram decrements and you re-evaluate after each one. Or B, you only do this if you're on fairly high dose steroid.
And what I will say as this comes through, and I can't remember whom I'm quoting, everyone knows the answer to this, but the trouble is no two people agree. But people seem to feel they actually do know the answer on steroid in COVID. But the range of opinion is striking. Since this is setting up what might be discussion for later talks, perhaps we can have a little time for this to come through. But basically, do you take a stringent approach to treatment because you believe it's a risk factor? Or by contrast, are you more worried about allowing interstitial lung disease to escape from control? And what is your view on lower dose therapy potentially in some way protecting against some of the early viral toxicity. What's your view? I think I'm going to keep going because we're not getting answers to this. But if we could, yes. So we've got a spread, but I think the balance of opinion is towards you're already worried about higher dose steroid and actually you stick with what you have and don't lose your nerve with lower doses of treatment. So I'm sure people will come back to that. Okay, continuing onwards. And this next bit is essentially, if I can go back a slide, which I'm trying to do. I'm determined that I will do if I can do. Thank you. I tried to summarize what is particularly perplexing about COVID pathogenesis, and this is relevant to the last two points. We recognize this, that viruses trigger autoimmunity, and they will do that without any lung injury at all, and not necessarily with disease in the lungs per se. And we recognize they trigger ARDS without autoimmunity. COVID appears to be unique in that both these pathways are so powerfully expressed and so frequently admixed. And I think we run into trouble trying to find a single COVID pathway, characterizing it as something or other, when in fact we've got these two pathways, they interact, they intersect, and it may be that immune dysregulation and autoimmunity is very early. But what this means is that in pre-existing ILD, it may be terribly hard to distinguish between progression of disease and acute exacerbation of disease and the direct impact of COVID in creating lung morphologic change. And then the other thing I think we can start to see now is those cases in which COVID has directly triggered an autoimmune process. Now, in this case, which sooner or later, yes, very good. This was a patient who had COVID. COVID symptoms went away. COVID negative on smear, positive on IgG. And then about a week later, started for the first time to notice lower respiratory tract symptoms, not needing to be seen in hospital. And over the next month, developed this picture. A classic organizing pneumonia, features suggestive of antisynthetase, great response to steroid. This was standalone traditional autoimmunity. And once you know that, you are very interested in that aspect as an early feature in COVID and admixed with traditional lung injury. So interstitial lung disease created by COVID, and I think this will probably apply to the subset who get fibrosis post COVID. Our challenge is going to be distinguishing these patients from the logical consequences of lung injury that we've always seen post ARDS and the morphologic abnormalities you will find one to two months later on CT. Now, I can't have very much more time left. So I'm just going to go through work points that create difficulty. Our whole practice right now is in transition in the way in which we monitor ILD patients. We've got to triage lung function use and monitoring as we never have before. Patients have huge concerns about traveling right now to be monitored. 
there's going to be a lot of local lung function and those people for those people who work in referral centres. And you're going to have to deal with the fact that gas transfer between laboratories is often misleading. I don't believe serial CT will suddenly have a new huge use because we've struggled to make use of it except when it's definitive throughout the last 20 years. But there may be a renaissance in integrating serial chest X-ray. And with the issues of lung function, equipment, contamination, use of the serial six minute walk test as a surrogate for serial DLCO needs to be explored. But perhaps equally important is the transformation, and I think this is my final slide, in our routine practice. And video consultation and telephone consultation, I'm here to say that it has in some ways transformed our practice for the better. So the days of bringing a patient up with an unselected, non-discriminatory group of tests that are standard, keying those tests to the visit and not to best timing have gone. And because at your initial consultation, you're not reviewing all the test results, you're discussing concepts, you can aspire, having had lengthy waiting lists, to same week video consultation or telephone consultation as an initial discussion, and you can time the tests at exactly the right time, taking aboard the material you've been sent to at referral. Importantly, multidisciplinary teams now have a new opportunity, the access to palliative care being central and to rehab, well, we're going to be forced to export these sub-disciplines. And one can see that with a creative approach, palliative care and rehab programs conducted by video linkage might provide a huge increase to in access to the point we've never really enjoyed in the past. And so I think that's it. I've given you a smorgasbord of uncertainties barely any data whatsoever. And I say again, a week is a long time in COVID and we are looking at a moving target. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Athol. Uh, now I, I hope that all speakers uh, uh, have time to answer the, some of their questions uh, uh, by uh, writing an answer in order to have more time for discussion in the end. Uh, so it is my pleasure uh, to have with us uh, Dr. Elizabeth Renzoni uh, from London, UK. Uh, she's half Italian. I've met her uh, as an ERS fellow uh, in London, uh, I would say uh, 20 years ago, Elizabeth. And uh, ERS is uh, bringing people together to work together and to be uh, very good friends. And now she is chairing the ERS uh, group uh, in CTDILD. Uh, so she is the one, uh, the expert, to talk about uh, uh, rheumatic diseases in ILD patients. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Katerina, and thank you and Venerino for inviting me. It's great to participate in this uh, webinar. I'm just going to have to see if this works. I'm not. Nope. Ah, good. Let's see. OK, so these are the uh, issues I'm going to be um, focusing on. Um, first of all, is the risk of COVID-19 increased in autoimmune disease patients on immunosuppression? And we know from previous coronavirus outbreaks, there didn't seem to be an increase um, in immunosuppressed patients. In a red zone in Northern Italy, a liver center, uh, patients were immunosuppressed with autoimmune liver disease, liver transplant, inflammatory bowel disease, did not seem to have increased incidence or severity. Um, there's a number of uh, series, one in uh, uh, New York, a prospective series, 86 patients with varied immune-mediated diseases, including rheumatoid, most of whom were on biologics, and again, no obvious increase in the severity of COVID. However, uh, there isn't enough data to reach dis definitive conclusions. Uh, we need larger studies with international collaboration, 
And uh, for the moment, of course, we don't have anything published uh, for patients with CCD IOD specifically. And uh, you would imagine that patients with CCD IOD are likely to be more at risk of adverse outcomes than patients with CCD, but no IOD and factors that might be risk, uh, risk factors for this might be the baseline severity of the IOD, perhaps the pattern. We know UIP pattern tends to be more likely to get into uh, acute exacerbations or the underlying CTD type. And all of these questions we do not know the answer to. What about corticosteroids? And Athol has alluded to this already. We know that uh, there is a dose-dependent uh, relationship with increase in infections, including viral infections in, uh, in patients. In um, the uh, previous MERS and SARS outbreaks, um, corticosteroid treatment early on in the disease was associated with a delayed viral clearance. Just to note, however, that the doses of steroids given was uh, hydrocortisone, 100 milligram TDS in this study in SARS, uh, so an equivalent of 75 milligrams of prednisolone, and this was associated with a higher subsequent plasma viral load. Interestingly, in the same study, patients who then received IV methylprednisolone after the first week did not seem to have a delayed viral clearance. So it may be a question of timing. Uh, we know that corticosteroids are associated with greater risk of infection than the classic DMARDs like azathioprine, methotrexate, mycophenolate. But then interesting, uh, interestingly, this um, systematic review of the literature by Rustin, Wittrand and co-authors found that a dose of prednisone less than 10 milligrams once daily was not associated with an increased risk of infection. So this is a, a multiple choice question um, for which there isn't really a definite right answer, but I would be interested to hear what you think. So a newly diagnosed patient uh, with anti-synthetase syndrome and progressive IOD would you delay initiation of treatment and just monitor? Would you treat with intensive immunosuppression, such as IV methylpred, IV cyclo? Would you treat with mycophenolate as sole agent, as it is probably less harmful? Or would you, in any case, avoid high-dose steroids at all costs? And I'll just give you a second, a few seconds. <laughs> I don't know if in the meantime we can go ahead. I'll just wait a, a little bit longer. But basically, just uh, just uh, just to introduce the uh, the treatment um, topic, so we can we can um, let's see. Okay, um, so so that's interesting. I think. Um, the mycophenolate monotherapy could be uh, a good answer, but I can see there's quite a, a good spread. And, uh, and also, I would agree that you wouldn't want to monitor in someone with progressive IOD. But in terms of the other options, probably all reasonable, but depending on the situation, on the single situation of the patient. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so you can envisage two main scenarios in terms of, I'm sorry, ha, anyhow, uh, it, it can be, no, I can't go back, doesn't matter. Uh, we can envisage two main scenarios, patients who are already on immunosuppression, so maintenance immunosuppression, and those who instead you wanna either start or intensify treatment. And just to caveat this, uh, what I'm going to say, uh, that there is very limited data to guide us on this. So these are just broad thoughts. So patients uh, with CTD IOD who are on maintenance immunosuppression, you would want to think about the fact that reducing immunosuppression could lead to more active IOD. Uh, potentially more systemic inflammation, and that this could itself be a potential risk factor for viral susceptibility, and that you might then be forced to use higher doses of immunosuppression, which would also increase the risk of, um, of COVID. 
However, if cautious tapering is felt to be possible, uh, from what we've said about the difference between high dose steroids and low dose steroids, you would probably prioritize tapering uh, corticosteroids rather than um, steroid sparing agents. And if possible, you would aim for a prednisolone dose less than 10 milligrams once daily. And just to say that also ACR and ULAR advise patients not to stop or reduce immunosuppressive treatment unless there is a specific uh, reason. So we've said, if possible, avoid doses of PED above 10. As a general rule, uh, unless you're very confident that the patient is stable and has been so for many years, you would probably want to continue either the mycophenolate or the azathioprine at the same dose. But as I say, this is not a general rule. If you have a patient midway through an IV cyclophosphamide course for progressive CTGIOD, you could consider an earlier switch to mycophenolate. And in the very few patients we have, for example, on antifibrotic agents, there isn't an indication to change this. And also very important for all patients to have a two-week batch of antibiotics at home uh, to be started straight away in the case of initiation of symptoms of chest infection. What about patients that uh, are either new um, with progressive CTDIOD or whose CTDIOD is worsening despite their stable immunosuppression? And again, it's going to be a case by case consideration. And especially, it's going to be a consideration of the pros and cons. And among the pros, of course, pros to treat more aggressively are the rapidity of the IOD with which the IOD is progressing. If you have a more inflammatory pattern, for example, the organized pneumonia NSIP pattern, and the severity of the IOD uh, will push you towards treatment. Against treatment will be all those um, factors that are risk factors for severe COVID, so older age, presence of comorbidities, and again, severe IOD, because of course we think that if you have severe IOD, the COVID uh, will also be, have uh, a poorer outcome. This is uh, uh, even more difficult, uh, the choice of treatment. So if possible, you would favor, as you've done with the, the majority have concluded for the question that I asked, less aggressive immunosuppression, such as mycophenolate, either as single agent, or in any case, using low doses of prednisolone. You might, however, have cases in which you do want to see uh, what happens with IV methylprednisolone, degree of reversibility, you have very severe disease, in which case you might consider lower doses instead of one gram, maybe 250, three uh, consecutive days, and then early lung function to assess uh, response. And if this disease is very severe, very rapidly progressive, you will consider the more aggressive immunosuppression. So IV cyclo, IV methylpred, or rituximab. And whenever uh, you are starting intensive immunosuppression, it will be important to test uh, patients on the day. And now we have rapid uh, response um, of tests within a few hours for COVID. Advise patients on their adequate PP, both in coming to the hospital and going away. Some patients come with tra hospital transport. And then, of course, advice on strict self-isolation after treatment. We've heard a bit about the monitoring. So blood test monitoring, the British Society of Rheumatology has suggested that if the patient is stable on a stable dose, the interval between uh, blood tests can be increased and doubled. Um, however, patients that start treatment will still need to have their usual blood test monitoring to exclude severe liver function impairment, severe leukopenia. And now we're seeing that home monitoring of selected blood tests, we're doing it for liver function, is also possible. And AFO has already alluded to this, how our monitoring of CTD, IOD, and IOD in general um, is going through a seismic shift, uh, but also how this can lead to opportunities for home monitoring, uh, including you know, oximeter at rest on exertion, home spirometry questionnaires, and how this might give us some um, outcomes that tell us about the disease and help us with management. Uh, and so in conclusion, we still don't know whether um, COVID-19 is associated with worse outcomes. 
um, whether it's associated with uh, uh, a rapid progression of IOD. We have very limited data to guide management of CCD IOD, and uh, it's important to make an individualized decision. And then, of course, we will need to validate, optimize, and validate our uh, virtual care and telemonitoring. And with that, I'm finished. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you very much. And now it's a great pleasure to invite Bruno Castani on the flo virtual floor. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. And uh, thank you for inviting me this evening. Uh, it's very exciting to hear uh, these excellent talks. So I'm trying to move my slides, but probably it will be possible, yeah? Here, yeah. Yes, okay, good. So I will begin with a very, very basic question. In your opinion, what is the best treatment for patients with moderate to severe COVID? I listed a few proposals. Uh, maybe there could be more Anti antivirals, corticosteroids, tocilizumab, anticoagulants. As you can see, a combination of drugs, antivirals, anticoagulants, immunomodulatory drugs, and last but not least, hydroxychloroquine with or with I, as a trimosin. I would be very happy to hear and to see what are your preferred treatment for this disease? And you, you will see my next question will be about clinical trials. So maybe we can see the results now, the best treatment. So I think we have the same experience now. We don't give one treatment to this patient. We want to give a combination of treatment going for viral, targeting the virus and targeting in inflammation and protecting the vascular uh, tree of this patient. This is very interesting. And what is interesting also is to see that you don't believe very much in hydroxychloroquine. So now we will move to the next slide. So what is now the most studied therapy for patients with moderate to severe COVID? The same proposals. So please vote again. Will you vote for the combination that you think is most important? Or will you select any other proposal here? So maybe we can see the answers. And I think we will see there this is a huge difference. So yes, so I understand that you are very aware of what is up, uh, ongoing in the world right now. So let's go to the next slide. The next slide, you are very used to, to this kind of picture. It's the COVID epidemic. It's more than 6 million people with data from yesterday evening. But now look at the other epidemic. It's a COVID trials epidemic. More than 1,300 trials ongoing in the world in, the in this disease. And what is the most studied drug in these trials? There is a very interesting study looking at this that you can find online in the trends in pharmacological science. And the most studied drug is not chloroquine. It is traditional Chinese medicine. It's very interesting that, in fact, the disease began in China, and so the Chinese were the first to set up trials. So now, statistically, the traditional Chinese medicine are very much being studied, but the second one is chloroquine. And you can see that chloroquine is being studied either alone or in combination with very different molecules. But we also know that there are viral targeting drugs such as remdesivir, antibiotics, immunomodulatory drugs, et cetera, which are being tested either alone or in combination. And this is interesting because if we consider the pathogenesis of a disease, it begins with injury. There is an exudative phase, a proliferative phase, and it can move to fibrosis. We saw this in the first talk about imaging. And it is very important to target both the virus, the 
activation of a coagulation system, I think we are all convinced and will not go into details here, and to target for inflammation. And do we have specific issues concerning COVID trials in ILD patient, patients? Not yet. Um, but we know that chronic respiratory failure may impact COVID prognosis. It has been shown in a few studies. Maybe the disease may be more severe in patients with pulmonary fibrosis. And for instance, in our center, uh, we listed 14 ILD patients with COVID. We observed five deaths, and all the deaths involved patients with pulmonary fibrosis, either IPF, asbestosis, or fibrotic NSIP. The role of antifibrotics is still unknown. And we know, and we listened to the talk of uh, Elizabeth a few minutes ago, that steroids probably, when the, when the dose is higher than 10 milligrams per day for prednisone, are probably not good. So what about the, the drugs which are supposed to target the virus? Just to summarize hydroxychloroquine studies, uh, there are a lot of trials going on, going on all over the world. Some of them are randomized. Uh, they were stopped a few days ago, but now probably they will be reassumed. The data we have suggests that hydroxychloroquine probably is not, not useful in most of the patients, but we will have to wait for the trials, uh, the randomized clinical trials, which are ongoing. You all know this paper in the Lancet, which put some uh, noise suggesting that in fact, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, either alone or associated with a microlite could be deleterious, but there is now some negative buzz about this paper. But probably the most important thing is here. If Donald Trump is taking the drug, probably this might be good. And this is very, very much a good argument, I think. So what about the other drugs? Remdesivir, for instance, I selected just two trials. The first one was negative. It was published in the Lancet uh, a few days ago, it, it compared remdesivir with, uh, versus standard treatment. It was uh, in China, it was about 250 patients randomized, and there was obviously no difference in treated or not treated patients. And this one is positive. 1,000 patients, so more patients. It was all over the world. It was prospective multicenter. And it seems to make a difference uh, and to speed up the recovery of patients as compared to the patients who were receiving the placebo. What is very interesting when you look at this data is that probably the patients who are receiving oxygen are, uh, do, do have a benefit with the drug, but the most severe patient, those who are receiving high flow oxygen, or even mechanical ventilation or ECMO do not benefit of a trial of a drug, suggesting that the different results may come because of different patients being included with a different severity. Uh, the combination can be also with interferon beta. I will not go into the details, but just showing that the data are accumulating, suggesting that sophisticated treatment targeting the virus may be useful in the future. So what about inflammation? IL-6 inhibition has proved until now is capacity to inhibit inflammation, which is not surprising. It is really the way this drug is working. So it reduces CRP, reduces the temp temperature. And in an Italian study, which involved 100 patients, they considered that it was good for their patients. However, if you look at the death rate here, 20 patient, percent of the patients who were receiving tocilizumab in that study were still dying. So it's not a magic bullet. And uh, we have to be very careful in the way we look at the data of the literature and we have to wait for randomized control trial. Inhibition of inf inflammation, 
can use other molecules such as interleukin one inhibition. Again, I will not go into the detail because we don't have good data randomized control trial even with these molecules, which seems very attractive. And I will go now for corticosteroids. There is a series of, of editorials from the beginning of the epidemic telling us to be very careful with corticosteroids. The WHO wrote that we should not give steroids to patients. There were words suggesting that we had to be very cautious with corticosteroids and even that clinical evidence did not support corticosteroids in patients. And uh, uh, some word, however, came from China, suggesting that sometimes the corticosteroids could be useful. And in fact, there is an expert consensus from Chinese colleagues about the use of corticosteroids. What is very disappointing is that this expert consensus is written in Chinese, so it's very difficult to understand for me, for instance. But in this editorial, the authors tell us some very important things about corticosteroids. They tell us the benefits and harms should be carefully weighed before using dr these drugs, obvious. Second, they tell us that corticosteroids should be used in critically ill patients, maybe, with hypoxemia and we, in patients who regularly use corticosteroids, further use of corticosteroids should be cautious, obviously. And we suggest that the dosage should be low to moderate and the duration should be short. And in fact, we have some uh, data in the literature that support this. If we look at this Chinese study, they looked at the effect of methylprednisolone giving uh, for a short time and a, a quite low dose and suggesting that the patient who were receiving methylprednisolone who had acute respiratory distress syndrome had a benefit in terms of survival. And there is this American study which was very recently published in clinical infectious disease. It is a, a quasi-experimental study. In fact, they looked at the patient who were treated in this time period and they received no steroids. And one week later, we decided to give methylprednisolone for three days or seven days in ICU in a different population. So first week, no steroids. Second week, okay for steroids. And as you can see, 200 patients included. 130 received the steroids, 81 did not receive the steroids. And it is very interesting to look at the data because you see that the group of patients who received the steroids, and in fact, a better survival here, had a reduced need for mechanical ventilation or for an, uh, uh, um, an increase in the intensity of treatments. Obviously, this is not a randomized controlled trial, but it suggests that patients with an acute COVID with evidence for inflammation may benefit of corticosteroids. And this was independently associated with a reduction in the composite endpoint taking after adjustment. So this is interesting because it gives some support to the idea that we need a combination of treatment. But what about fibrosis? In fact, we know that there is fibrosis going on in the lung of these patients. And there is a question about the use of anti-fibrotics or anti-fibroproliferative drugs in those patients. And we probably have similar experience with some patient who have a typical acute COVID and will develop in the next week's fibrosis, such as in this patient, we will now go for lung transplantation. So we set up a trial 
which will be begin in the next days, where we decided to look at patient three months after acute COVID, select patient with persistent lung abnormalities on HRCT with evidence of fibrotic signal, reduce the LCO, and randomize to receive either nintodonib or placebo. This, we, obviously, we don't have data yet, uh, but we will begin in the next weeks randomizing the, the patient, and we will follow them for the next 12 months, assuming that some of them could have fibrotic a, pro, a progressive fibrosis, and that will be vitus will be reduced by the use of nintedanib. So probably next year we may have some data uh, to share with you. So this we, we this I will conclude. You see that we don't have very good evidence right now, and we need randomized trials to validate the option about steroids and immunomodulatory drugs, and obviously. We need better national and international coordination if a second wave is to come to avoid this waste in COVID-19 research, which has been recently highlighted by different people. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bruno. Uh, you will have some time if you want to answer uh, the questions. We have a lot for you. Uh, and I, I will suggest that the speakers now can uh, answer and type uh, some of the questions. And uh, after uh, the last talk, but not least, uh, we have with us uh, Sergio Harari from Milan. Uh, Milan has been attacked in Lombardy, uh, uh, very next to Greece uh, uh, and uh, uh, by COVID disease. Uh, so we would like uh, Sergio to talk about the day after in patients recovered with uh, pre-existing ILDs and uh, to close uh, the session. Thank you, Sergio, for being with us. Thank you very much, Katrina for your words and for the invitation. Thank you, Venerina, and thank you for society. It's really amazing to be here this afternoon. Uh, I will try to share with you some uh, thoughts about uh, some issue that have been already discussed, but perhaps we can add some more uh, ideas about it. Um, so, so these are my coin. And I would like to share with you in the next minutes uh, some uh, topics, uh, the COVID-19 infection and ILD, perhaps uh, some new perspective, pulmonary fibrosis uh, and COVID-19. Uh, Bruno have, uh, has already given an excellent talk with many insight. Uh, perhaps we can add something more and COVID-19 disease and ILD common approaches. Uh, so starting from, from COVID-19 and uh, interstitial lung disease, the patient group in whom uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection is most uh, lethal are men, as already said also by Otto Wells in the seventh decade of life with comorbidities, smoke exposure is also highly representative of patients suffering from IPA. We do not have yet data reporting the incidence or mortality of the viral infection in patient with IPF. Given that the risk factors for poor outcomes in the viral infection are common in this patient group, who are further debilitated by reduced pulmonary reserve, and it is possible that the prognosis is even worse than in patients with IPN than for the general population. Also, if, uh, as already discussed by Atoll Wells, uh, we don't see many patients with IPF and COVID infection. Uh, data are conflicting. 
about uh, rheumatic patient infected by COVID-19, but we have some data from China and uh, Professor Renzoni already discussed uh, deeply this issue, just to mention that the rheumatic patient may present with more severe symptom when infected with COVID-19 with a higher risk of respiratory failure compared with no rheumatic group. There are many common clinical characteristics between this viral infection and flare of rheumatic diseases. And this condition may lead to the misinterpretation of rheumatic disease flare and further delay in the recognition of COVID-19. And this is also true for IPF and acute exacerbation, as Atul said before. There are multiple ways that the COVID-19 pandemic will directly affect patients with fibrotic ILD. There are common risk factors for poor outcome restricted access to key components of the diagnosis process, new uncertainty in the use of common ILD pharmacotherapies, limited ability to monitor both disease severity and the presence of medication adverse effects, and finally, significant curtailed research activities. About COVID infection in patients with ILD, this association may show specific problem for antifibrotic and immunosuppressive therapy. Patients should be encouraged to continue non-pharmacological therapies such as exercise. Patients should also be encouraged to maintain social support for virtual means, and also this has been discussed by my previous uh, colleagues. Management at home with nurse specialists should be implemented. And coming to the issue of pulmonary fibrosis. If we look at the story of SARS, there is a 15-year follow-up study, study on 71 patients that show that in transitional lung abnormalities and functional decline recovered over the first two years following infection and then remain stable. At 15 years, 4.6% of the lungs showed interstitial abnormalities in patients who had been infected with SARS, and long-term follow-up of patients who recovered from MERS has not been reported. Pulmonary fibrosis secondary to ARDS and COVID-19 is another issue. Follow-up studies have shown that persistent radiographic abnormalities after ARDS are of little clinical relevance and have become less common in the era of protective lung ventilation. About 14% of patients with COVID-19 develop ARDS and 20% of RDS cases are severe. The long-term pulmonary consequence of COVID-19 remains speculative and should not be assumed without appropriate prospective study. The prevalence of COVID-19 fibrosis will become apparent in time, but early analysis, as discussed by this paper recently published on the RJ, Early analysis from patients with COVID-19 on discharge from hospital suggests a high rate of fibrotic lung function abnormalities. 47% of patients had impaired diffusion capacity and 25% had reduced TLC. This was worse in patients with uh, uh, underlying disease. And this is a study uh, regarding uh, the temporal lung changes in high resolution uh, CT. And uh, as you can see, the pattern of lung high resolution scan varies over time and reticulation also represent probably irreversible fibrosis, but seems to change its uh, incidence over time. So probably we do we have to know more information about the 
high resolution evolution also of the uh, lung alteration. Pulmonary fibrosis may develop, I mean, according to this study, early in patients with COVID-19 after hospital discharge with a high incidence uh, of uh, abnormalities. Older patients with severe illness during treatment were more prone to develop fibrosis. A imaging finding in COVID-19 pneumonia seemed to be milder than in SARS. And coming to the last point, just to mention some common issue between COVID-19 disease and ILD. Both had no cure. Optimal management of complication and comorbidities are our goals. Optimal treatment of end of life also is an issue with symptom management and relief, breathless, cough, fever, anxiety. Psychosocial support is fundamental also for family as family of patients. The role of rehabilitation program probably is very important and uh, we will have to uh, investigate uh, how to manage rehabilitation in this patient and probably will be uh, an important room for that. And uh, another issue as discussed by Professor Cristani is uh, the role of antifibrotic therapy that is a very interesting and important issue. So in conclusion, as the wave of viral infection recedes, other problems will emerge and will need to be addressed. Given the scale of COVID-19 pandemic and the number of people requiring invasive ventilation worldwide, post-COVID-19 fibrosis is likely to be a substantial problem. An adjustment of ILD patient immunosuppressive regimen, depending on the stability of their disease, may be reasonable. And if immunosuppression is reduced, a clear-cut plan to monitor and treat exacerbation of ILDs should be in place. Thank you. I will stop here. Uh, thank you, Sergio. Um, so I will start uh, with uh, some questions uh, from uh, the audience. And uh, I would like to thank all the participants. Uh, we have uh, 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 more than 250 uh, pay, uh, participants with us. And thank you. Uh, and uh, great talks. Uh, so I will uh, try uh, to sum up the questions to, uh, to you now. So the first one is going to Venerino. And uh, they are asking uh, if uh, we have histology data with cryo or with not cryo about uh, uh, COVID disease. And I know you are a very expert also in this issue. Uh, and then uh, I would like uh, to ask also Venerino, it is for Venerino, if we have some uh, knowledge about the expression uh, of ACE2 receptor in uh, pneumocytes type 2. Uh, we know uh, some issues from asthma and COPD uh, regarding uh, the smokers, uh, but uh, if we have some data in ILD. And in the meanwhile, I would like uh, to ask Sarah after Venerino if uh, she has the, uh, observed uh, some more bleeding in uh, uh, patients uh, that she uh, did uh, the cryobiopsy during COVID disease or in ILD with uh, COVID, but I, I know that she didn't do the procedure. Uh, so regarding uh, increase of bleeding uh, in the pandemic um, uh, era. And uh, then uh, we're going to move uh, in the trials and the drugs. So the first session is uh, this one. And also if uh, Georgia would like to add something about the vascular component in a CT and uh, how we are going to uh, evaluate or to, to have some uh, is, uh, you know, uh, notice about that because it is important for treatment reasons. So Venerino, histology. Thank you, Katarina. I, I'm not the speaker of the-, of the Yes, message. but you have the questions. <laughs> anyway, it, it is very interesting, but we started 
deciding to perform biopsy because we considered that the use of drugs was a, a research, was a kind of research. So if you give drugs without knowing what is happening is worse compared to knowing what is happening with semi invasive approaches. Saying that we had, I think, interesting data because the majority of data we have so far are from autopsy and autopsy is not what is happening in the majority of the patient uh, for sake of God. And um, I have to say that the analysis of the data are, are still ongoing, but we can say that COVID-19 is not an IRDS. It's not a diffuse alveolar damage disease with not Mem align membranes. It can explain why part of physiology is completely different mm -hmm. compared to the classical ARDS. And I think uh, Atoll is still in, in, in uh, connection. I yes. think the, the idea of Atoll that it is an autoimmune disease is very interesting because it's a disease driven by lymphocytes. We have lymphocytic infiltration in the early phase and is a, a pneumocytic disease. So the, the trigger is start from type 2 pneumocytes. There is a, an important proliferation of type 2 pneumocytes and can, this can be the first step of the cytokine storm and then we have, we have the appearance of other complications. We have the typical diffuse air damage in intubated patients, but probably intubation and the mechanical ventilation is the main cause of diffuse air damage, not the, not the viral infection. What so, is your opinion uh, about, the, the, uh, the, about the, the... the point is that we have um, vascular, I don't say vascular proliferation, but some typical vascular changes also in the early phase. We have not, we do not have mic microthrombi in the early phase. We have microthrombi in the advanced phase. In the early phase, we have a kind of, it's not correct the term, but we have vascular dilatation. It, it can explain, for example, the, the sign that the Jordan described with vascular enlargement and can explain part of the ground glass. But Athol suggested COVID-19 as a, an autoimmune disease and I think that his hypothesis has also an histological confirmation of support. What, what is your opinion about the French study of uh, describing histology uh, in some patients about uh, acute fibrinous organizing pneumonia, fibrosing uh, organizing pneumonia. Do you agree with uh, this? Uh... We, we have only one patient with, with mm. a similar mm. pattern, only mm. one in the early phase. Okay. Arthur, would you like to further comment or do you well, have yes, any... I, yes, I think I would. And for the start of my comment, the missing bit of the jigsaw, is that the studies have been centered on advanced disease by and large when the train has probably already left the station. Yeah. So there's been a great deal of focus on lung injury. Look, if you have traditional lung injury pathways mixed with immune dysregulation, you actually have processes going on in parallel, feeding off each other. AFOP can be seen as ARDS with disproportionate organizing pneumonia, but less hyaline membranes, and rather than a single process. I don't think that label helps us. In fact, we're looking at a combination of lung injury mechanisms and immune dysregulation, which then in combination give you that label. And what interests me really, we must of course focus on this fatal advanced disease but the steroid therapy effects we see in advanced disease, with the rescue of patients against the odds from time to time, ECMO patients once in a while coming off ECMO within two days of receiving steroid, there are exceptions. But the question to me is whether, in fact, a key early part of the process is a more classic autoimmune process, which we see in isolation in occasional cases, whether that's amplifying injurious pathways, it's being fed into by adaptive immune dysregulation due to injury, and whether actually an early approach with gentle immunomodulation might actually be highly effective. Now, we see these effects in advanced disease. It might be steroid, doesn't work in early disease, but it might equally be that very early treatment gives us an opportunity with this approach that we do not have in general 
when the train has already left the station. And the challenge I... for us finally, finally, is getting at these patients and trials in early disease. Sergio, sorry, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Arthur. Uh, just to mention, uh, we had uh, recently finished a uh, uh, study multicenter in Italy about the use of steroids in the acute phase of the disease. Uh, and uh, the data I su submit for publication. But I want to mention that uh, also our experience as center and many Italian centers that adopted this protocol are quite positive uh, and uh, we have the feeling that steroid in uh, the acute phase uh, uh, are an effective treatment. Uh, on the other hand, one of the major issue I believe in this uh, difficult story of COVID is that we do not understand when, why one patient have an asymptomatic or a very few symptoms like I had, for example, and uh, uh, another patient uh, die. So the re uh, what happens, uh, because unfortunately, here we have seen also young patient dying. Uh, and uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is true that patient older and with comorbidities at a higher risk, but we also have seen patient very young dying. So there is something in the spectrum of this, this disease that we do not understand. And another thing that uh, we're now observing in Italy, like in France and in other European countries, I not, do not, not know exactly in the UK, is that uh, if you look at emergency department, we see many few patients with severe disease. So the spectrum of disease is shift to a very mild uh, way of presentation. And we do not know, know why, because in Latin America, it's not bad. Do you think that it is because of a mutation uh, that, uh, you know, has to do with the viral load or... Mediterranean uh, uh... climate, weather. <laughs> I'm not the right person to answer, but I must... Uh, I can only mention that all virologists in Italy were not able to find mutation that explain the uh, shift of the present clinical presentation. Okay, uh, there are a lot of questions regarding the use of antifibrotics, uh, and I would like uh, uh, Bruno to comment on that. Uh, but he already suggested the French study. And uh, moreover, I would like to comment uh, uh, about the, the French study, uh, about the uh, tocilizumab study, that uh, we've had this uh, uh, early news and we wait for the study now to be published. Uh, is it under review? Uh, do we know something more? Uh, so two issues and one third for you uh, regarding the use or of Fafinib. Uh, Fafi Pinavir uh, antiviral uh, again uh, uh, in combination with steroids. If you have to say to us something, well, first for the tocilizumab French study, I would say uh, we have to be very careful not to speak too quickly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so just wait. Mm -hmm. uh, I think those guys were very enthusiastic at that time probably too much and too, and too quick. So mm -hmm. please wait. And we all wait for the full data to be released when they will be mature. First point. Second point, steroids. Uh, we have similar data to the, the data which have uh, been uh, given by Sergio a few minutes ago, suggesting that indeed corticosteroids are very useful and improving the survival of the patient. We never give the steroids alone, always with an antiviral drug, depending on the avi availability and the local availability of the, of the drugs. For instance, lopinavir, ritonavir was available in France where, when remdesivir was not. So I cannot comment on the third drug that you just mentioned, Katerina, but uh, just, yeah, this is the point. About the antifibrotic, I'd very, I'm very cautious about that. Why? Because the experience we have from the SARS and from the MERS mm -hmm. and from the ARDS indeed suggests that there are a very limited number of patients 
we will develop fibrosis. Mm -hmm. But just remember that the number of patients affected with COVID is huge. So even a rare event may become uh, um, quite frequent in clinical practice in the next months. This is why we are ready to use nintendanib or placebo because this is a randomized controls study just to be ready in case of these patients do appear. And in fact, we see some patients like that. But I would say not outside from trials, not outside from studies, because these drugs are expensive. Uh, we don't know really who would, if they are useful for some patients or not. So I would say really go for trials and not uh, without a kind of organization. However, we will have no data at the end. Uh, Professor Poletti? There is just one comment regarding tochilizumab. And that's Sergio. We had severe infections after tochilizumab treatment. And so, yes, I think in this disease, what happened, and probably because it was an overwhelming pandemic, we use a lot of drugs without any clinical trial. And we considered the use of drug just useful for anecdotal. Uh, results, but yeah, I think the the, the steroids, low dose steroids, are at, at the end by definition much less dangerous compared to tocilizumab. So we started with tocilizumab. is expensive, can be dangerous, and we didn't consider steroids at low dose. And Sergio reported the preliminary data, and are very good for low dose steroids in this patient. So the the Prudent medicine probably was better compared to the more sophisticated medicine in this context. However, what we've learned is that uh, um, uh, we need uh, randomized control uh, trials with placebo arm. Uh, so that's why we have to weigh the solidarity and uh, uh, other uh, uh, arms uh, where also hydroxychloroquine uh, is uh, used uh, in placebo uh, trials. Uh, so I think this is a lesson that we've learned. Maybe we are, uh, we've had a lot of patients in, uh, uh, in risk uh, uh, dying. So uh, I think uh, we apologize because everyone uh, tried uh, to use uh, drugs uh, not uh, within a trial. And now we know that uh, maybe a combination uh, uh, treatment would be useful. And uh, I, I liked uh, the trial, uh, the phase two trial with antivirus plus interferon. Uh, and we need, of course, the phase three trial. We know that uh, uh, we have a patient in different uh, stages and early stage is very important in the disease. Uh, also, the vascular component is important and we have to take care of it in patients uh, uh, in the, that they have a vascular component uh, and we have markers uh, to identify it. We know that uh, now pharmaceutical companies uh, are going in combination studies, for example, tocilizumab plus uh, rendesivir, and we wait uh, the results. Uh, and uh, uh, do we have any data regarding ACE expression in uh, pneumocytes in ILDs? Uh, uh, we know from uh, COPD that and in smokers uh, that uh, are increased expression in uh, uh, smokers. Uh, so uh, they have one more uh, um, uh, opportunity for the virus to enter our cells. Uh, and I would like to highlight uh, that uh, uh, it is important to stop smoking. Uh, that uh, the, the last uh, day of May was the smoking cessation day for uh, all over the world. And we have a data uh, also in COVID area regarding the dangerous role of uh, smoking. Uh, and uh, uh, I would like Elizabeth, Sergio, or Sarah. Sense. We have one comment from Sergio. Sergio. Mm -hmm. Yes, regarding I, 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 the I, I, bleeding, I, I, And regarding the bleeding from cryo, and uh, we would like one comment from Sarah. Uh, I apologize, but I, I will have to leave. Uh, so, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the, this very interesting uh, a webinar and also the discussion was really very stimulating. I just want to answer to a question that was made by 
a colleague uh, from India, and uh, regarding the problem to encourage patients to stay at home to avoid hospitalization is what we done in uh, the second phase of the pandemic uh, in Italy, and it was a disaster because the patient arrived too sick and it was impossible to do anything. If we want to manage patients with steroids, with other drugs, we need to uh, treat them in the early phase uh, of the uh, cytokinic uh, uh, wave. So uh, absolutely not uh, to uh, stay at home. So thank you very much and sorry again to leave before. Ciao, ciao to everybody. Ciao, ciao. See you in Milan, I hope soon. <laughs> of course, and, uh... we wait for everyone. <laughs> thank you, ciao. Okay. Uh, Elizabeth, Sara, would you like to comment on something? Uh, about regarding bleeding and uh, transbronchial biopsies and uh, interventional procedure in general, in increased bleeding. Yeah, so um, I don't have an experience on transbronchial biopsy in COVID patients because we weren't performing uh, cryobiopsy in COVID patients. We were performing BAL only in suspected cases, not in confirmed cases. Uh, so uh, this was mainly to protect the personnel from the possible uh, risk of infection, of course. But I would be very uh, interested to know from Venerino what is his experience also, because we will have a prospective multicentric study running on the follow-up of those patients. And for those uh, who will uh, have, uh, uh, in which we will detect uh, uh, interstitial lung diseases or interstitial lung changes at three months of follow-up, uh, we will perform cryobiopsy. So my question to Venerino is, uh, do you think, Venerino, that there will be an increased risk of bleeding? We haven't observed this with BAL, but I don't know with the cryo. And the second question is, uh, would it be interesting to compare your finding of the early phase to the finding of the follow-up and to the finding of other uh, interstitial lung diseases like IPF and SIP or other pattern, fibrotic pattern? We, we didn't have bleeding complication. We had one pneumothorax that was expected and we didn't have any infection for the, for the doctors and the nurses. So we were protected. And, I was saved at the end. I was very interested for the Athol presentation. He presented the case who developed an op uh, organizing pneumonia like pattern after COVID-19. And we had these kind of cases in which we performed BL and cryo. BL was negative for uh, SARS-CoV-2. And we have uh, an increase of lymphocytes and OP and SAP like pattern in, in uh, in histology. So it's true, Arthur, you are the teacher, it's not dependent on the age, but only on the brain. <laughs> I will comment briefly on that because I think it's a completely open question as to how much fibrosis and ILD we see downstream. So we're seeing these cases where you don't get the lung injury, you don't come to hospital, but you, you're starting to see patients who are following an autoimmune pathway. And I don't think we have any idea whether these are small outliers at this stage or whether we will see a fairly large cohort like this. I can understand the difficulties that after ARDS you seem to have fibrosis in the traditional viral ARDS and it will go away. But also in that group there's clearly, and maybe I'm biased by ECMO, these patients are living long enough for you to be able to see that they're developing fibrosis in a subset. So I think it's a completely open question. Bruno, I think appropriately and admirably downplayed the frequency as somebody who's running a trial, but I think he may be onto with this trial something very major. And finally, going to the other end of disease, if we're going to use slow dose steroid, I fear that in hospitalized patients, the major benefit of it exists may be a little bit too late. And the difficult trial is use of very low dose steroid right at the outset of COVID. And I think it can be done. The drug is cheap. The downside needs to be explored. But it may be those immune 
dysregulation pathways are critical in early disease and we're missing a huge opportunity. And the more you see about the efficacy of steroid coming through in more advanced disease, the more you start to believe that we might be missing something huge there, which needs to be explored. Okay, I think uh, that we have to conclude. Uh, we, we are over time as usual in ILV meetings. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank all of you. You are going, you are going, you are going to conclude. I will give you the role to conclude. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, the participants for being uh, with us. Of course, our society uh, gave, giving us the opportunity to, to see each other and to talk each other. And it was a great pleasure because we didn't travel all this months and uh, we didn't have the opportunity to uh, to see each other to meet and to have dinners and dancing together uh, but uh, ah. I hope that we will do uh, sooner or later uh, I hope it will. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much and I would like Benerino to conclude uh, as a chair and the president of the assembly the session please Benerino thank you Katerina I, I owe this uh, webinar, this seminar to Katarina because she is always full, plenty of ideas. So I thank Katarina and thanks to all the speakers. I learned a lot and I hope, of course, to meet you face to face as soon as possible. Have a nice night. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Thank you very much. Thanks. Good night. Oh, good night, Ali. Ali, 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 good thank night. you. See you. <laughs> ciao a tutti. Ciao. Bye-bye. Ciao. 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 Yeah, Indeed. let's it do it. Let's happiness. do it again. <laughs> oh, no, we should do. We should yes, do. Yeah. See you, see Katarina, you it's up to you. It's up to you. Yeah. Up to me. Okay. Okay. A week's we, a long we time in too. COVID, yeah. Katarina. A week's a long time in COVID. So yeah. there won't yes, be any, yeah. any danger that there won't be new data. Indeed. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Have a nice dinner. Bye. Bye. You too. I won't have a nice dinner because I'm cooking it. <laughs> <laughs> you, I think we're the only two people still left, aren't we? Yes. <laughs> Bye. Yeah. There are still 133 people. Oh, wow. Participants. <laughs> so they are leaving. But... Okay. So, thank okay. you, Ali. Thank nice you, Ali, for uh, nice to, yes. Thank it you. It's always a nice pleasure to, see you. Uh, to coordinate. Bye -bye. We did it very well. Bye. 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 Everyone. Bye.